Thank you. Um, a very great pleasure to be here in Doha. Um, and um, thank you for, for that very kind introduction. I'm convinced uh, that religion has a major contribution to make to one of the chief tasks of our time, which must surely be to build a global community where people of all persuasions can live together in harmony and respect. And yet, how can that be when so often religion is seen not as a solution, but as part of the problem? All too often, religious people are said to be ill at ease with the pluralistic society uh, that is coming into being in our global world. Um, w people seem to think uh, that religion is the cause of violence. I've lost count of the number of times I've jumped into um, a taxi in London, and when the cabbie asks me what I do for a living, I'm informed quite categorically that religion has been the cause of all the major wars in history. In fact, uh, the cause of a war is usually ambition, hatred, greed. Uh, but often these self-serving emotions are given an idealistic or a religious coloration in order to sanitize them. And yet, of course, religion has been implicated in some um, atrocities of the recent past. And yet, I still am convinced that it has something important to teach us. And so I was very pleased when I received this invitation and heard that the faculty here at Georgetown wanted me to uh, focus, or at least to, be, to take into my uh, discussion, my book on the Axial Age, the Great Transformation. Uh, now, what is the Axial Age? Uh, well, the phrase was coined by uh, Karl Jaspers, the German philo philosopher, uh, to refer to that moment of history uh, which was the pivot of humankind's spiritual experience. Uh, it stretches from about 900 to 200 BCE, at the time when all the major world faiths that have continued to nourish human beings either had their origins or their roots. Uh, the, this kind of new spirituality took place in four distinct regions of the world, in China, uh, in India, in the Middle East, and in Greece, in Europe. Um, it, it's thus, in China, we have the growth of Confucianism and Taoism. In India, Hinduism and Buddhism. In the uh, Middle East, we have the roots of monotheism, which would come to fruition later uh, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, and finally, we have the philosophical rationalism developed in Greece, um, which has been the origin of uh, Western rationalism um, and has become uh, a religious movement in its own way, a philosophical movement that has shaped the lives of many people, uh, not only in the West, uh, but also in the Muslim world. Uh, now, what have, this is the age of the, the Buddha, Confucius, uh, the sages of the Upanishads, uh, it's the age of Socrates and Plato and Aeschylus. Uh, it's the age of the great prophets of Israel. Uh, and later, of course, uh, the age of the great rabbis uh, of the Talmudic age, uh, the age of Jesus, and the age of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But what have these long ago luminaries to say to us today in our 21st century? Uh, these faiths are all marvelously different. People often accuse me of saying that I'm trying to say that all religions are the same. Uh, all religions are not the same. Uh, my job as a historian of world religion would be much, much easier if they were. Uh, each of these traditions has its own distinct genius. 
each its own particular insights. Um, and I personally have learned and been edified uh, by them all. And yet they have certain values in common which speak directly to our current condition. One of the f things that I think has gone wrong in the modern age, because it, it is certainly true uh, that religious people can be opinionated, exclusive, intolerant, um, is that they insisted that when we speak of the ultimate reality, which has been called God, Nirvana, Brahman, Tao, uh, we think we know what we are talking about. They, these people insisted that uh, Brahman, God, Nirvana, Tao was beyond what we could know. We can have intimations of it, but we can never define it. Uh, when I was a child, at eight years old, I had to learn this definition of God in the Roman Catholic Catechism. God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I have to say uh, that at eight years old, that didn't mean much to me. And I still find it, frankly, a rather pompous and arid definition. But over the years, as a result of 20 years of studying the religious, uh, religions of humanity, I've also come to believe that it is incorrect. Because it takes it for granted that you can simply draw breath and define a word in English whose uh, original meaning means to set limits upon a reality that has to go beyond everything we can think and know. When we speak of God, we're at the end of what words and thoughts can do. Allahu Akbar. God is always greater uh, than anything that we can actually simply say and believe. Uh, the Buddha, for example, always refused to define nirvana or say what it was because he said that it was something that could only be experienced by a man or a woman who had lost his or her ego. That egotism, that selfishness that holds us in thrall to a particularistic, limited viewpoint where we, where, by we relate everything to ourselves and cut everything down to size. Um, Confucius said once to his disciples, oh, I wish I did not have to speak. Oh, wise master, said his disciples in distress, if you didn't speak to us, how would we have anything to tell our own students about you? Heaven does not speak, said Confucius, heaven being the high god of China. And yet, look how effective heaven is. Because of heaven, the stars wheel in their constellations. The four seasons follow one another in due order, and yet, Heaven doesn't, has no speaking. Heaven has no words. And his, uh, I think he was trying to indicate that if we could only stop all this uh, sort of th theological chatter, we too might become as effective as heaven itself. In the Indian subcontinent, the ultimate reality was called Brahman. Uh, and it was absolutely impossible to define the Brahman, to cut Brahman down to a neat definition. Uh, Brahman can be translated the all. Brahman is not a, a, a being. Uh, Brahman uh, is, uh, you can't pray to Brahman uh, because Brahman is also in yourself. It would be like speaking to yourself. Um, and yet, in the um, 10th century BCE, uh, the Brahmin priests established what I, can't, what I can't believe to be an authentic model of theological discourse. The object of this competition, it was a sacred competition, the uh, Indians were Aryan people and they loved competition. Um, like the Greeks, who were also Aryans. And um, the, the, the object of it was to define, to find a verbal formula in which to describe or encapsulate the Brahman. 
an impossible task, you might think, but nevertheless, they continually tried uh, to achieve it. And it would begin by the priests heading off into the jungle, into the tropical forests, where they made a retreat. And that tells us something straight away. You can't talk about God in the same way as we talk about a, a, a business deal or have an argument with our wives. Uh, you need to put yourself into a different frame of mind, different from our ordinary secular thinking, uh, in which we, uh, you, you put yourself into a more receptive frame, ra rather in the sort of frame uh, in which you uh, listen to music or um, engage or, or listen to poetry. Uh, that, in fact, when you put um, somebody into sort of a brain machine when they're listening to music, different kinds of parts of the brain are at work there. Um, and different kinds of receptivity is involved. So they went off into the forests, and there uh, they engaged in spiritual exercises, again, to put themselves into a different frame of mind. Uh, they fasted. They practiced uh, breathing exercises, an early form of the yoga that would become essential uh, to uh, Indian spirituality. And then when they were ready, they came back and the competition uh, began. Now, the challenger would kick off and he uh, would draw on all his learning and spirituality and wisdom and come out with a, a verbal formula that he felt summed up what he meant by Brahman. And the others would listen and they had to respond in kind. And um, the winner uh, was the person, however, who after they'd banded around their descriptions of Brahman and their verbal formulae, the winner was the priest who reduced all the others to silence. And in that silence, the Brahman was present. Its presence became felt not with the wordy definitions, but with the stunning realization of the impotence of speech. Um, when we are speaking of the ultimate, of the divine, we are at the end of what words and thoughts can do. Uh, the, in, in the medieval uh, Christendom, they had a word for that part of the mind that tips over into transcendence, that which goes beyond uh, what our normal mundane experience. They call that part of the brain uh, intellectus, intellect. Uh, now, uh, we have sort of cut down the word intellect, to, to, at least in the West we have, uh, to uh, indicate the, the reason, rationality. Uh, but for the medievals, intellect was that moment, uh, that part of the brain which makes it possible uh, for us to realize that we've come to the end, we've pushed reason and thinking uh, to its ultimate conclusion, and there's, nothing, there's no more to be said. It's rather like uh, the end of um, a great concert or a, a recitation of poetry or some beautiful music. And sometimes when the last words or the last notes have died away, there's a moment of silence in the hall uh, before the applause begins. It's a very full, significant moment, very pregnant, full of silence. The purpose of theology should be to help us to live in that moment of silence. Um, but all too often, like my definition of God, uh, it, the words get in the way. And we start to believe our words and think that they actually can encapsulate and uh, hold in there uh, the, the, the essence of, of the ultimate meaning of life, the all, the Brahman, the God, Nirvana. Now, all the world faiths have, in their own way, reproduced uh, that uh, 
sort of Brahmogya competition, uh, that, uh, that Brahmogya speech, that tipping over into silence. Uh, I'd like to just mention Thomas Aquinas, uh, who in the West, 12th, 13th century uh, philosopher, uh, was famous for his five proofs for God's existence. Now, um, proofs for God's existence. Most, pe most people said that it was impossible to prove God's existence because uh, we can only prove with our reason things that are material. Um, and God is clearly not in that category at all. Uh, but Thomas Aquinas drew on the latest science, Aristotelian philosophy, and he drew also on the arguments of Ibn Sina, uh, Maimonides, um, and the Greeks. And that's important. In those days, uh, Christians were not frightened of science, and they were not frightened of other faiths. Thomas Aquinas was writing at a time when some of his contemporaries were butchering uh, Jews and Muslims in the Crusades. But he was ready to learn and uh, study the works of Maimonides and Ibn Sina um, and uh, Ibn Rushd uh, and, and learn from them and bring, the, bring this, their wisdom to the people of the West. And drawing on these, he comes up with five uh, proofs. He, called, he didn't call them proofs. He called them five VA, five ways for God's existence. And he says, yes, uh, following Ibn Sina and all these others, he said, yes, uh, God is the, the first cause, the beginning of everything. They must have had a, a, a beginning. Uh, he is the highest excellence. He is necessary being, whereby all other beings come from other beings. We all come from somewhere, and we all have a cause. God is being itself. Uh, and finally, and, and, and at the end of each of these proofs, he comes out with a set phrase. He says in Latin, that is quod omnes dicunt deum, which can be roughly translated, that's the sort of thing that everybody means when they say God. And then it, having seemed to prove God's existence so that it's all quite clear, done and dusted, as we would say, uh, he, Thomas pulls the rug out from under our feet. Uh, this is the part that people don't always read. Uh, he says, uh, but we don't know what it is we've proved. All we've proved is the existence of a mystery. We have no idea what we mean by a necessary being. Uh, we, again, uh, we, we have no idea uh, what we mean by God even. Even the word God uh, is difficult. We can't say, is there a God or God exists, he said, because our notion of existence is far too limited to apply to God. We're talking about another kind of reality. And we can't say, is there a God? Because God is being itself. God is not a sort of thing. Um, and so he's used those proofs, those scientific proofs, rather like the Brahmodya, to push our reason to the ultimate and then leave us in that moment of silent awe. Now, uh, some people say nowadays, well, of course, we can't prove these things. We just have to believe it. Um, now, um, this has become one of the bugbears of our time, uh, believing things. We often talk about religious people as believers, as though accepting certain doctrines on faith, on, on trust, uh, is essential to what the most important thing they do. The Buddha used to tell his disciples, never take anything on trust. Never take anything at second hand. Even my teachings, if they don't help you, leave them to one side. Put them into practice. And the word belief in English has changed its meaning. Um, in the, up until the 17th century, the word beneven, as it was pronounced in uh, Middle English, meant to love, to commit yourself. It was related to the German Liebe, or the Latin libido, desire. Um, it meant commitment, loyalty. Um, it did not mean accepting a whole uh, lot of ideas or propositions. Um, it 
the, so when the Bible was translated into English, um, the word pistis, the Greek word pistis used by Jesus to say he wanted people to have faith, uh, was translated believer. And people now read the Bible uh, because in the late 17th century, the word changed its meaning to say that Jesus wanted them to believe uh, that he was, he was the son of God, an idea that Jesus would have found rather strange, I think. Um, but uh, Jesus is not asking for belief in that sense. He's asking for commitment. And if you read the Gospels, you see quite clearly that Jesus is asking his disciples to um, give all they have to the poor, to work hard for the coming of the kingdom, uh, to uh, live like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and have trust, faith in God their Father, not accept a whole lot of propositions. And religion, of course, is not about thinking things or believing things, but about doing things. What is the Quran but a call to action? When the Quran uh, talks of faith, um, it doesn't mean that we have to accept a whole lot of ideas, but it follows it up always it, with its performing the works of mercy, the salihat, uh, that it is uh, asking people to look after the poor and the vulnerable, to free their slaves, to take care of orphans and widows. Uh, it's not asking for belief. I mean, the, the Quran is rather scathing about theological orthodoxy, which it calls zanna, self-indulgent guesswork. Um, at which makes people quarrelsome and sectarian. Uh, it's very, very odd, if, uh, the Quran thinks, that uh, Christians and Jews argue about who Jesus was. How can you prove it one way or the other, says the Quran? Uh, are you mad, Christians and Jews? Uh, we, we, this, is, this is something, um, the, religion is about doing things. Uh, when you look at God's creation uh, and you uh, look at the wonders that God works, these, these wonderful signs, ayat of his benevolence, it's a call to action so that you too uh, will uh, be, behave generously, as generously to the people around you as God has behaved, has uh, given of himself all these wonders of nature to humanity, poured out all this beneficence. Now you might say that revelation uh, comes down and, and it stops and we are uh, then uh, obliged to continue it, but that's not how people thought about revelation in either the Christian or the Jewish worlds, and certainly uh, not how uh, the, the Muslims conceived of revelation. Um, if you think of Certainly, it was, it was all there in the Quran, but every tradition represents a constant dialogue between an unchanging, uh, transcendent reality and current events on the ground. If you think just for a moment of the terrible years that followed the death of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, there were the, the great fitnas, the trials, uh, in which uh, Omar, Uthman, Ali were murdered. Uh, King, the, 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 uh, Hussein, uh, the beloved grandson of the prophet, was killed by the Umayyad Caliph, where you have wars with the companions of the prophet on opposite sides, killing one another. Now, a lot of people would say, right, that's the end of Islam. It, it, this was a nice idea, but it didn't work. That didn't stop the most pious and creative and courageous Muslims, who as they saw these events unfolding, and as they saw uh, uh, that they were now living in a very different world, not in the small community of Medina, but in, uh, the, in, in, in the larger world of empires, and were building, beginning to build an empire themselves, uh, what do they do? They sit and they study together in small groups. And from these intense discussions about how can we make the Quran speak in these new conditions, they created many of the ideologies that have since characterized Muslim piety. Sufism, uh, 
the Shia, uh, fiqh itself, uh, jurisprudence, the collection of hadith, uh, in order that by looking at the, the conditions in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, received a revelation, this could be applied analogically to their own times so that they could come to their own very different times and make the Quran live again. Um, and so, uh, the, like the sages of the Axial Age, the people who came after them were not afraid to innovate, to, to change, to take new ideas, uh, and to make the, 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 what the glories of the revelation sing uh, and a luminous song to their own troubled times. Um, and that, in a sense, is our task today. Now, another thing we can learn from the sages of the Axial Age is that they lived in times rather like our own. And these sp spiritualities uh, of those of the Buddha, those of the prophets of Israel, those of uh, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were not living in peaceful, violent times. They were not uh, created on lonely mountaintops or desert fastnesses. Uh, these were turbulent political times where violence had reached an unprecedented crescendo. Now, of course, the violence that was being experienced in those days was puny compared with what we're faced today with our terrible weapons that in, can inflict such hideous damage. But they seemed shocking enough uh, to people uh, in, in those times. In, in, here in Arabia, for example, at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the, uh, the, the tribes were convulsed in an absolutely unprecedented spate of tribal warfare. And in Mecca itself, uh, a new aggression, a new commercial aggression was pushing uh, people to the sidelines, pushing them into poverty, pushing them into marginality. And the Quran comes to answer this inequity. Um, and each one I found when I was writing my book, The Great Transformation, about the Axial Age, I found that in every single case, one of the catalysts for religious change was a revulsion from that violence. Uh, uh, right at the beginning in, in India, uh, the priests uh, looked around at the new, uh, violent, the new level of violence that had happened in the states and kingdoms that were being created at that time in the ninth century BCE, and uh, developed the doctrine uh, of ahimsa, nonviolence, uh, that has been absolutely crucial to Indian spirituality. Yoga is something that is very popular in the West today. Um, it's, uh, it's taught in gyms throughout London. Uh, but it's very different from the kind of yoga that was going on at that time. Yoga was not seen as an aerobic exercise. Um, it wasn't a way of getting slim and toning up. Um, nor was it a way of feeling more peaceful about yourself and coming to terms with yourself. It was about the systematic uh, ex expulsion of the ego from your thinking. Ego, selfishness, which is the root cause of so much evil in the world. Where we, where we want to attack one another because they threaten us, our interests. Um, and yoga was about systematically taking the I out of your thinking. But before you could even begin uh, the simplest yogic exercise, you had to embark on a moral program. And top of the list was ahimsa, nonviolence. And that didn't just mean that you couldn't kill anything. I mean, you, you certainly you couldn't. You couldn't kill or injure anything physically. You couldn't even swat an insect. Um, in that heat, you couldn't swat an insect or a fly. Uh, but you couldn't speak a cross word. You mustn't make uh, an impatient gesture or roll your eyebrows to roll eyes to heaven in exasperation. You had to exude uh, uh, a spirit, an attitude of kindly affability to everybody, even the most annoying monk in the community. 
And until your guru was satisfied that this was second nature to you, uh, and you'd won that battle against that irritation, that desire to hurt or to wound, uh, you could not even begin to sit in the yogic position. Um, and, but it wasn't a question of simply not doing things, not uh, uh, the, uh, hurting. Uh, himsa means not harming. Uh, you had also to, de to behave in a positive way, an attitude of positive kindness and goodness to others. And every single one of the major world faiths developed at the core of its uh, ethical teaching the principle of compassion. Now, this is often summed up in what's sometimes called the golden rule. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. Sometimes expressed in the positive form, always treat all others as you would wish to be treated yourself. Uh, and it now seems to me quite clear that unless as a species we learn to treat all peoples as we would wish to be treated ourselves, whoever they are, whatever their beliefs, we are not going to have a viable world to hand on to the next generation. And that any ideology that breathes, encourages hatred or contempt is failing the test of our time, failing humanity. Because this is what our sages said. Not one of you can be a believer, said the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, unless he desires for his neighbor what he desires for himself. Uh, the principle of the golden rule is, is written very easily, quickly into uh, the uh, Quran from the very early start. The early biographers of the prophet, peace be upon him, said that, uh, tell us that in the early days when he started first to receive revelations, he, kept, he spoke about them only to his closest friends and family and didn't go public with these uh, this, this, with these messages. And then, they tell us, for a period of two years, the divine voice fell silent, and there were no revelations. And this was a period, the biographers tell us, of great sorrow and desolation for the prophet. Peace be upon him. He wondered whether he'd somehow been tried by God, but found wanting. It was a, 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 you'd, perhaps he'd failed, and he was obviously found to be not suitable to be a prophet after all. And then suddenly, after these two years of darkness, it ends with Sora Daybreak, uh, which comes in a burst of luminous assurance. By the morning hours, your Lord has not forgotten you. And, it, and then, uh, did we not find you an orphan and give you help? Did we not find you poor and give succor to you? And here's the corollary. As for the orphan, do not oppress him. As for the poor, do not turn him away. You yourself uh, know, uh, the Quran is saying, what it is like to feel that desolation, that abandonment, that loneliness, that terror. Make sure, therefore, because we have we, God, have taken that sorrow away from you, that you make sure that nobody in your community and in your vicinity suffers that desolation yourself. Never uh, have treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And then it ends, the surah, with a command, and now the grace of your Lord proclaim. And the prophet peace be upon him, has to leave the consolations and privacy and security of uh, private life and proclaim, uh, go public with his message and face all the dangers that we know uh, came to him at that time. Um, one of the f earliest people uh, to uh, formulate the golden rule, as far as we know, was Confucius. Um, and uh, his disciples asked him, Master, which of your teachings uh, is the central thread that runs through everything you say? 
what is the single thread that pulls all your teachings together? And what teaching, which of your teachings can we practice all day and every day? Notice that, all day and every day. In England, we have a habit uh, of saying when we do something nice for somebody, well, that's my good deed for the day. As though we could then uh, go back to our usual selfishness and unkindness and bitterness for the next 23 hours. Uh, no, uh, all day and every day. Uh, so Confucius explained what he meant uh, in the word shu, which means likening to yourself, making your own feelings the guide to your treatment of others. You, he said, seek to establish yourself, then seek to establish others. You want to turn your merits to account, then make certain that other people have the opportunity to turn their merits to account. Never treat others as you would not like them to treat you. Look into your own heart. Find out what gives you pain, or what has given you pain in the past, and then refuse under any circumstance to inflict that pain on anybody else all day and every day. And if you do that, the Confucians discovered, uh, you would leave the ego behind because you were dethroning yourself from the center of your world day by day and putting another there. And you, in that way, uh, they said you encountered the Tao, the ultimate reality, the way. Um, the rabbi, great Rabbi Hillel, the older contemporary of Jesus, was once approached by a pagan who promised to convert to Judaism on condition that the rabbi recited the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. And Hillel stood on one leg and said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the Torah, and everything else is only commentary. Go and study it. And it's a deliberately provocative, witty statement, but very uh, insightful. It's, it, many of the things that we would think to be essential to Judaism, uh, the creation of the world in six days, 613 commandments, uh, the exodus from Egypt, the Holy Land, this is a mere gloss on the golden rule. Um, and Jesus uh, taught very much the same thing. Now, but I find uh, on my travel, since I've been talking about this, that um, people are very vague about what compassion actually means. Uh, in England, the word has so fallen out of our lexicon uh, in this modern age uh, that people often think it simply means feeling sorry for people. Um, and I, in, in recently, I gave a lecture in Holland, and the text of my uh, lecture was published, in, uh, a translation was translated and published in the Dutch newspaper. And I specifically said that compassion does not mean feeling sorry for people. Uh, but every time I said the word compassion, the Dutch translated it pity. Uh, it, it, it was, it's sort of ingrained. But compa compassion comes from a Greek or Latin root, compathein, which means to feel with the other, to undergo something with, some, with, with, with a person to suffer something with another person, to put yourself imaginatively in the shoes of another all day and every day. Um, not to put yourself in a special category where you think, well, I'm one kind of special kind of person, but my, and these, this suffering has nothing to do with me. Putting yourself in that position um, of pain. Um, and, um, but in Hebrew and Arabic, uh, the word al-Rahman is related etymologically to the word for womb. And that raises the specter of mother love. The icon of the mother and child is um, a, a, a universal symbol of uh, humanity. Um, and yet mother love is hard. A mother has to get up to her crying child every single night, no matter how exhausted she is. She has to put her own needs and desires on the back burner 
and be aware of what that child is doing at every single moment of the day, ready to lunge forward to save it from harm, constantly aware of what she, her responsibility to that baby. And then this cute little baby grows up and can become an awful disappointment. Uh, but a mother never gives up on her child. Even though the child may turn out to be a monster, a mother will still never give up on that child that she bore. And there's a, 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 a Buddhist prayer that says, let us cherish all creatures as a mother, her only child, uh, which indicates that we have to have the same sense of responsibility preoccupation and concern with all creatures, all species, and all human beings, no matter how disappointing and disillusioning our fellow human beings may be. In uh, the Buddhist and uh, Hindu tradition, karuna, translated compassion, has nothing to do with feelings. Uh, it's a resolve, a resolution to, to, to liberate all beings from their pain. One of the things that unites us as human beings is that we all suffer. Every single one of us, even the most unfortunate, fortunate people among us, will suffer at some point in their lives. All of us have pain. And sometimes when we look at the uh, magnitude of global suffering that we see all around us in our newspapers and on our television news. We feel ashamed that our, because our suffering seems so petty, and yet they matter to us. We can wake with, uh, with misery uh, if we rem by remembering an unkind word that was spoken uh, thoughtlessly, uh, but perhaps uh, you know, never, not remembered by the speaker at all, but it has struck an arrow, an ice, into our hearts. And karuna means that you resolve, not only that you will not inflict such pain on anybody else whatsoever, uh, but that you will um, uh, work energetically uh, to free human beings from their misery. And that is a responsibility that we have to cultivate a sense of responsibility for other people's pain. Not just seeing it as something that's happening out there for which we, we really can't do anything about, uh, but which uh, we, uh, we, 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 as a religious person, we are, we are called to assuage. Uh, it was for this reason that when in 2008 I won the TED Prize, uh, TED is an acronym for Technology Entertainment Design. It's uh, a, 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 a non-profit organization best known for its conferences on uh, ideas worth spreading. And every year they give awards to people whom they think have made a difference, but who with their help could make more of an impact. They give you some money, and they give you a wish for a better world. And so I asked TED, because I felt that compassion seemed not to be spoken about sufficiently in uh, religious circles to help me to create, craft, and propagate a charter for compassion. And it was written by uh, leading activists and thinkers in six of the major world religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, uh, Hinduism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. It's a demonstration that despite the fact that we seem to be at loggerheads, the religions can work together for a better world. But it was never meant to be just a feel-good feeling, uh, good for, you know, where we all felt wonderful and warm and compassionate, uh, but that we would work energetically. I've just come back from Pakistan, and I cannot tell you what people are doing there in that uh, needy country that feels itself so much poised on the brink of an abyss but who are working practically, businessmen are working practically, members of civil society, to make compassion a living, luminous fo force in our torn world. Now, ultimately, uh, there's a, uh, the, the sages of the Axial Age made it quite clear that it was not possible for us, it was it, forbidden to confine compassion to our own group. 
our own congenial friends, the people, our own community. We had to have what one of the Chinese sages called yan ai, concern for everybody. We have to, and, and that's shown very uh, in, in the prophet's own lifetime. Um, in his mirage, his uh, ascension to heaven. You know the story, of course. Uh, the prophet, peace be upon him, was uh, sleeping beside the Kaaba, and Gabriel came to him and transported him to Jerusalem. There he was greeted by all the great prophets of the past, who called him brother, welcomed him into their community, and then they began, uh, and, and they asked him to preach to them. And he, after he'd finished his sermon, he ascended through the seven heavens, conversing with some of the greatest prophets of the past, with Jesus, Moses, John the Baptist. He has some discussion with Moses about how many times Muslims should pray. And he's thinking of 10 times a day, and Moses says, don't even go there. This is totally unrealistic. Uh, try for one. And uh, eventually, of course, as you know, they fix uh, five is, is the, the number of times. And that's often taken to be a sign that Islam is the middle way. It's neither excessive neither, nor too lax. But this is also a story of pluralism. Uh, the prophets uh, welcome one another. They don't say to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how dare you, you upstart, imagine that you are a prophet. They welcome him, they ask him to preach, they listen to each other, they share each other's insights. And I think this symbolizes the prophet's yearning to bring the Arabs who seem to have been left off the map of salvation right into the heart of the monotheistic family. Um, God is the light of the world, uh, says the Surah al-Nur. Uh, neither in the east nor the west, it cannot be confined to a single lamp. Uh, it, it, there is that wonderful outreach in the Quran wh whereby we uh, must uh, get to know all tribes, all nations, not confine ourselves to our own tribe. Jesus said, love your enemies. And people often say, well, that's totally unrealistic. It's a contradiction in terms. Are we expected to feel sort of warm affection for Hitler, for example? Uh, but Jesus is not talking about feelings any more than uh, the Buddha was. Um, the, he's, using, he's making a rabbinic commentary on a, a, an ancient Hebrew text, Leviticus. It's in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the word hesed, used here for love, uh, was not anything about feeling. Leviticus is a legal text, a very dry legal text, and talk about emotion would be as out of place as it would be in a Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the word uh, hesed was used in international treaties. It was a technical legal term. Two kings who may have been enemies promised that they would love each other, and that didn't mean they would fall into each other's arms, uh, but that they promised that they would now look out for one another's needs. They would come to each other's practical aid. They would, uh, uh, they would defend their, uh, and be absolutely loyal to their new ally at all costs. Seek their, his good on all occasions, even if it went against their own short-term interests. Now this is the kind of love that we must give, to, even to our enemies, so-called, in this torn world, because the enemy is not out there anymore. The, we are now interconnected as never before, economically, uh, politically. What happens in Afghanistan or Iraq today can have repercussions in New York tomorrow. What, uh, when one market goes down in one part of the world, stocks plummet right the, right the way around the globe that day. We are, uh, we are all facing environmental catastrophe. Whether we like it or not, we have, we are bound together at the same time as we are deeply polarized. And yet often our perceptions don't, haven't caught up with this reality. We must give each other practical support for the simple reason that if we don't, uh, this will rebound on us. Uh, we, we, it, the world will be no longer viable. Um, now, um, I'm going to finish, however, 
with the ancient Greeks. Now, we don't often think of the Greeks as religious and or certainly as compassionate, uh, but they, uh, they were, a, a, in some ways, a terrible people, a violent people, a, a invented a new species of warfare. But at the, at, they were the founders of the Western rational tradition. And at the time when they were at their, their height, the fifth century BCE, they invented a new tragic genre, the genre of, uh, the, of, of tragedy. Every year, as a religious festival, uh, the leading playwrights of Athens would put on uh, tra tragic plays. Uh, th these plays usually uh, retold one of the ancient Greek myths. Um, but they ch the myth was changed and adapted in order to reflect a current problem that had been uh, plaguing Athens that year. The plays were a communal meditation. Um, everybody had to go. It was a civic duty. Prisoners were let out of jail so that they could join in this uh, because it was a civic duty, an exercise to meditate together on the plight of Athens. And in these plays, the Greeks put suffering on stage. We like to push pain away because we get, we get not another earthquake, we say, not another flood, uh, not another war. I'm sick of these, these spectacles of misery. We feel overpowered and want to push it away as though it had nothing to do with us. But the Greeks uh, ex presented in these plays men and women in an extremity of agony wrestling with impossible d dilemmas, with pro problems, and ha having to come to terms with the unexpected uh, consequences of their actions. And periodically, the leader of the chorus would turn to the audience and say, and now weep, weep for Oedipus, a man who in real life you probably shun because he had completely by accident, uh, not knowing what he was doing, uh, married his mother and killed his father, but breaking a major taboos. And the Greeks did weep. They didn't simply wipe an embarrassed tear from the corner of their eye and gulp hard, because they believed that weeping together created a bond between human beings. When they watched these plays, they realized that they were not alone in their pain, that suffering was the human lot, uh, that this is what brings us together because we all suffer. This is one of the things we all have in common. Now, the first one of these plays to come down to us uh, is Aeschylus's The Persians. And it was presented in Athens seven years after uh, the, uh, the Athenians had defeated the Persians, the Persian army, at the Battle of Salamis. But before they'd achieved that victory, uh, the Persians had rampaged through Athens. Uh, they had burned and robbed and knocked down houses. And they, then they'd gone up to the sacred hill, the Acropolis, outside the city, and destroyed all the beautiful new temples that had been built there. And now Aeschylus is asking the Athenian audience to weep for the Persians. Uh, to look at the Battle of Salamis from the point of view of the people who have been defeated. Uh, there's no triumphalism. There's no gloating. Uh, the, pre the Persians are said to be a sister people with the Greeks, equal to the Greeks in nobility and dignity. When Xerxes, the defeated general of Salamis, arrives uh, home on the scene to announce that he's lost the battles, uh, the, he's escorted with great reverence into his house. The Greeks, the Persians, are presented as a people in mourning. And, um, but what Aeschylus was asking the Persians, to, the, the Greeks, to do is recognize the enemy too had pain. The enemy also suffered. And sometimes when I'm speaking in New York or Washington, I sometimes say, now, after 9-11, after that period of time, uh, could you put on a play in Broadway that asks your American audience to weep for parts of the Muslim world uh, and, and who are, which are suffering? 
and they, they smile ruefully uh, because this is a, it was an extraordinary thing. Now, this ability to recognize the pain of the enemy uh, was, goes back very far. It goes back to Homer, and on this I finish this story. Uh, the Iliad is a long, long poem full of war, I have to say, uh, full of battles and gory descriptions of wounds. Um, and it tells the story um, of one small incident in the long 10-year war between the Greeks and the Trojans. And in the course of this, this incident, um, Achilles, the chief warrior on the Greek side, uh, has a quarrel with his king. And in a fit of egotistic pique, he uh, goes to his tent and sulks, rather like a child, um, and he withdraws all his troops from the battle. Now, this is absolutely disastrous for the Greek side. And in the ensuing uh, confusion, he, Achilles' beloved friend Patroclus is killed by Hector, one of the Trojan princes. And Achilles goes mad with grief and rage and guilt. And he challenges Hector to a duel. And the two of them fight it out in front of the both armies, the Greeks and the Trojans who are watching this. And on the, uh, Tro the walls of Troy, Hector's family, the royal family of Troy, are watching the bat, uh, this, this fight. And of course, Achilles kills Hector, and then he mutilates the body. He ties it to the back of his war chariot, and he drives round and round Patroclus's grave. And then he does an even more terrible thing. He uh, refuses to give uh, Hector's body back to the family for burial. And that means, in Greek terms, that Hector's soul will never know rest. It will wander unhappy and unsatisfied for all eternity. Then one night, into the Greek camp comes Hector's father, old King, King Priam of Troy, in disguise, comes right into enemy territory, and he makes his way to Achilles' tent. Um, and when he re arrives in the tent, he takes off his cloak and disguise, and of course everybody is shocked. And they watch while this old, frail man uh, comes to Achilles and falls at his feet, embraces his knees, and weeps. He, at this point, uh, Homer calls Achilles man-slaughtering Achilles, uh, because uh, Achilles has not only killed Hector, but many other of Priam's sons. And Achilles, uh, still rageful and grief-stricken, looks at the old man, and he remembers his own father, and he begins to weep. Uh, and the two men weep together, each for their private sorrows, but creating a bond between them. Priam weeps for all the sons that he has lost, and um, Achilles weeps, he uh, uh, Homer says, now for his father, now for Patroclus. And then, then they fall silent, and the two men look at each other, and Achilles goes and gets Hector's body. And he lays it very, very gently in the arms of the old man, very concerned that the uh, weight will be too much for him. And then the two men look at each other, and each sees the other as sacred, as divine. Uh, I think this is the, 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 what I'm trying to say. I think it, this story expresses the spirituality that is possible in our time. When we open our hearts to recognize that our enemy also suffers, if we can make ourselves weep for the enemy, we are most close, closely akin to God. Thank you. <laughs>